Greetings, friends. Book Bro here. Today, for our um, book discussion, we will be discussing Reservation Trash by Ray Harvey. I have reviewed this book before, a couple years ago, before I started this uh, channel. I'm going to pin the review that I wrote to the description below, and that review suffices or stands more as my general opinion on the book uh, as a, a work of literature, as a work of art. Um, and I don't feel like I need to add too much to that. That's not the reason why I wanted to discuss the book today, though I would like to reiterate for those who don't, who choose not to go check out the written uh, review, that I thought it was an excellent book. Um, it was actually very inspiring to me. Um, the reason why it was inspiring, we'll, we'll kind of get into that a little bit in this discussion. But um, so since in the couple years since uh, 2018 was when the book was published, um, was when I read it. I read it very shortly after it was published, I believe, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, in that time, obviously, a lot has changed, has it not? Uh, the world is a very different place. And I found my, my mind goes back to the book um, because of that. And uh, because of the... <clears throat> I believe the book, serves an, uh, the, the book serves as an example of something that should be happening and that should have been happening for decades leading up to the present time, which may have uh, helped us avoid the situation that we're in. The situation that I'm referring to, of course, I'm sure some people will disagree with these, the, the political perspective that I'm going to get into, and that's fine. If you do, you're welcome to move on or you're welcome to listen and see if maybe... Um, maybe it'll challenge some of your ideas in a good way, but regardless... Uh, so obviously we're dealing with COVID in that whole situation, but for me and people of my particular um, personality makeup, what has been far more disturbing than the um, virus, which is obviously a terrible thing, but what has been more dis disturbing and what I consider a more terrible thing is uh, the suspension of basic liberties and basic rights. Uh, for people all across the world, including here in the United States, which I never would have imagined was possible. Um, it's been very disturbing to me personally to see how readily people will give up their rights out of fear, whether or not that fear is warranted. When you try to have these discussions, it, all, it often comes down to people the debate will move to um, whether or not the virus, the severity of the virus, um, is as extreme as some have sold it in the past. Um, and, and this all reminds me, I have to be very careful with what I say, because as we all know, YouTube, Google, everybody's censoring now. And it also brings, I'm, I'm going to do it. Save the Oxford commas. If you like the shirt, I'm going to pin the location to buy it into the description below. If you like it, consider buying it because I would really like to avoid um, having to use any kind of ads or anything to monetize this channel because I disagree with censorship policies of these various bodies and I don't want to do anything to contribute to their bottom line. But if not, that's cool. What I'm about to say is more important than uh, supporting this channel financially. Um, so, okay, yes, for those of us who believe that this... All right, let me get back on track. Anytime you debate whether or not the lockdowns were accurate, we get into the discussion about um, the severity of the virus. And to me, that is basically irrelevant. Not basically, it is irrelevant. Um, I don't consider basic human rights to be negotiable, and I don't think they are things that any person... Uh, I don't think it was our founding father's idea that freedom was something that would be given and taken away based on whether or not it was safe. And that's ludicrous. That's actually ludicrous to even um, say. <clears throat> and um, so for me, um, these rights are absolute and they transcend any, any and all physical dangers. So just to know where I stand on this, where my philosophical and political position is on this, that's where I stand on it. And so, what are these um, the events of recent time ha has really made me aware of the fact that we've totally lost the narrative in terms of the importance of freedom, the incredible rarity of freedom, but um, possibly more than anything else, the 
absolute essential nature of freedom. And I think part of the problem is that somebody like me, I am honestly flabbergasted that this that there are people out there who actually need this case to be made to them. Like people who are by nature those who are determined to be free and can and don't want to live any any other way. It's hard to conceive of the idea that there are some people who don't think that way. It's very odd, but it's true, right? There's a lot of people out there for whom freedom is not the number one priority, and it may not even be in the top five priorities. And in those cases, it's far too easy to say, well, those people are idiots, or those people are weak, or whatever. But those things are, they're ineffective. They are, um, they're actually counterproductive because all they lead is some st- is to some stupid bickering. And believe me, I am very guilty of doing that. I get it. My point is, though, um, we got here because there was a culture war going on with only one side fighting. I mean, um, for whatever reason, the uh, more libertarian freedom mind. When I say libertarian, I mean with a lowercase l, not a capital L. I'm I'm not a real big fan of the libertarian party. <laughs> but um, but is even let's do away with the politics of it because there are people on, I think there are plenty of people on the left who also prioritize freedom, um, so it's freedom, right? It's it's freedom, whatever the political ideals are, who cares? It's people who value freedom and value freedom above all things. Um, that case was never made. And that's how we wound up in this situation. Like, we have the whole media machine, the whole academic machine, everybody can very strongly defend positions of collectivism, socialism, communism, um, and just the general um, the need for the government to help people. The problem with that is that there's the counter narrative has basically been non-existent. By which I mean, are there even people who realize that capitalism does have a moral and philosophical foundation to it? That doesn't mean you don't you don't have to agree with it, but it does have one. Like the the, the people who implemented it and thought about it, they thought about those things. It, it was not just a, a a thing that people got together and said, "Hey, man, here's a way here's a way for mega rich people to make more money." I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, there is a very strong philosophical um, foundation and tradition to freedom, free markets, capitalism as being means to better lives. Like that, that's the thing. When you get into these arguments, it's like I, by nature, am somebody who wants to be free above all else. But that doesn't mean that the philosophical, uh, the foundations of the concept of freedom as being the best means for human happiness and human flourishing, that doesn't mean that that doesn't exist just because I am personally inclined towards freedom no matter what. I would rather be free and dirt poor than be uh, a fat, a fat, happy slave. That's just how I am. But it doesn't matter because... It's not just a matter of my personal preference. It's, it is logically and rationally defensible that freedom is the best avenue towards human flourishing, um, human happiness, prosperity. And I also think solutions to problems such as uh, environmental problems, all of these things. But the the side that believes these things just basically wasn't engaging in the culture war and various reasons why I think that is, but who cares? Like, uh, uh, the reason why doesn't matter. I think what matters is going ahead, looking at how to move ahead. Which is what made me think of Ray Harvey's Reservation Trash, which is a beautiful book that inspired me a lot. The book works as a story in itself. You don't, even if you, well, I don't, I, you can't really avoid the political perspective in the book, which is kind of one of the things I'm going to get into. So I'm not going to lie and say anybody of any political persuasion could enjoy this book. I think that's probably inaccurate. But um, I think, I think people who are even moderate could, um, 
who are kind of like in the middle could appreciate the book as a story in itself it's a story about a navajo runner um called a uh oh what are they called wait wait wait, wait. sorry some kind of runner that runs in races that he is not officially enrolled in and in many cases not even invited or welcome to there is apparently a word for it oh i wish i had this i'm all right i like to do these live because i want the I want the recordings to be of my authentic um, thoughts and feelings in the, in the moment, and so I'll do a little bit of studying beforehand, a little bit of writing beforehand, but it's very rough, and I like to be more off the cuff. Sometimes that doesn't work well, such as in this case when I cannot find what the term for the kind of runner is, but um, oh, that's going to bug me. That's going to bug me, that's going to bug me, that's going to bug me. All right, I'm going to find the term and put it in the description below. But he's a he's a runner who's he's not motivated by what most people are motivated by, which is you know like um, fame, fortune, all that stuff. Uh, he runs because he loves to run. He's he's driven by other things, and so it's about this remarkable uh, runner, Navajo runner, um, named Christy Reed, who it's just kind of his adventures. Um, it's his adventures through life, but especially through running, obviously. I mean, it, it's really, the book is a lot about running. But interspersed throughout the narrative are, are frequently, um, there are, Harvey uses the book as a way to discuss um, the philosophical premises of freedom. And um, especially he goes in great depth into and I think this is where people can look, learn the most from this book, or, or get the most out of the book in terms of um, real life philosophy, because he discusses um, quite a bit um, the connection between owning personal property and freedom, personal freedom, and um, this is, is so important right now as we're looking at the age of the Great Reset, where. It, it's still too hazy, but it's start, certainly starting to look like some aspects of the Great Reset really were, whether or not they were consciously implemented or what, it sure seems like they're trying to put a lot of them into action. But even if not, do away with that and say, nah, that's that's conspiracy theory stuff, that's fine, it doesn't matter. Um, what, the, what is inarguable is that with everybody under 30 discussions of um socialistic ideas of giving up personal property are very common and there's really not a counter narrative and i've been there i've been there when i was young i was a i was a diehard socialist i actually read marx you know i wasn't just a pretender like i i actually read marx and i thought about it greatly and i actually made some life decisions that i really wish i hadn't made and i made them because i believed so much in those ideals and um the big thing is there there was no there was no other option no nobody nobody was talking intelligently and seriously and deeply about um the ethical premises behind free markets and um, and especially not finely detailed things like the important connection between personal property and personal freedom and those things those two things are intrinsically linked i don't believe one can exist without the other um, and that's a case that harvey puts out very well here and i'm not going to go into great depth i would really encourage people to read this book or maybe you're not a literature or fiction person and just just go out there and look for other people who have discussed this and my point is i don't want to get too deep into um, any of these specific points because my the the real thoughts that run my mind when i put this together were that we need more books like this we need more tv shows like this we need more movies like this um you know the the left side of this equation has done a great job and i mean i 
I actually respect, I have a tremendous amount of respect for the, the will that has been put forth into um, putting these leftist ideas into all forms of media. Um, I mean, they've been at it a long time and they, they have controlled the narrative for a very long time. And I actually give them credit for that. I mean, I, I appreciate winners. I appreciate competitors. I'm a competitive person. And while they were fighting the war, the other side of the equation seemed um, uh, more just more caught up in acquiring wealth and um, not paying attention to the world around them. And so it's been a one-sided battle. And we've needed stuff like this. We've needed stuff like this for decades. And, uh, and now is the time. Now is the time. And maybe it's too late. I don't know. Could be. Could be. I, I, I do fear that the, the love of freedom has been kind of squelched. Um, for the reasons that I just said, because nobody has been defending it. And by nobody, obviously, I'm using hyperbole. And there have been some people defending it. But, you know, up until a couple years ago, it just wasn't really a part of the discussion. Um, you didn't have a lot of people who were honestly trying to make people understand the ethical, moral, and rational foundations for things like the free market and freedom in general and so because there was nobody defending it it just died i mean it's it just got whooped and um harvey's book he actually reminds me a great deal of ayn rand and i i know the second i say ayn rand that's gonna maybe i should have just opened by saying ayn rand because that, that'll trigger a whole bunch of people and you could have known right away that you shouldn't watch this any further but um he reminds me of rand and um in the sense that he will use uh, conversations and dialogue as a way to push forward um, to give the philosophical debate uh, space to work. And he, he uses the different characters in the dialogues as mouthpieces for the, the opposing sides. Um, that's something Rand did all the time. I mean, I think with Atlas Shrugged, like the entire end of the book, we used the trial as a way to put forth the ideas that Rand wanted to put forth. And um, Harvey does something, Harvey does the same thing in a different way. I, I'm trying to say he does it without making it sound uh, derivative because it's not derivative of Rand or anything like that. But it uses the similar style or uses the identical style, but in a different way. Um, yeah, and um, I mean, actually, me uh, bringing up Rand is uh, uh, she was like one of the few voices out there who was trying to do what I'm talking about, and uh, to this day, she's known and loathed by many people and idolized by many people for being that one brave voice out there. Um, if I, I don't yeah, I don't want to just say brave because I, I mean I like I said I I believe the leftist novelists and leftist entertainers and leftist artists um, I, plenty of them were very brave I mean especially you go back into like the 50s the 60s earlier time when um, America was a, a conservative place that did have a lot of serious problems with uh, racism and um, just a general kind of closed mindedness <laughs> and um, I mean those people were brave to stand up and and let us also not forget that they did some amazingly important things I mean the civil rights battles of the 60s were noble and uh, if we're going to engage in this conversation then we have to acknowledge that not only acknowledge it but tip our hats to it I mean yeah those people were out there getting their heads beat in by cops protesting um, for African American rights and things like that. I mean, yeah, I, I, they were right on and they were brave. And um, I also think in many ways they were right. Though I think in many ways the right parts of that movement were used as a Trojan horse to get in the bad parts. But whatever, again, uh, I'm rambling a little bit, but, uh, or not rambling, but I'm, I'm speaking a little more than I intended to. But it's because I think this is so important. I authentically believe this is incredibly important. And maybe um, 
the most important mission of our time uh, to wake people up to how precious freedom is how rare and why it works what the premises are what the foundations are and why they work and um, I am a person who has beliefs that could be called spiritual and I I believe freedom also has spiritual foundation but that's one I I feel like they should be handled in different ways because not everybody is spiritual and then those that are have very different ideas of what that means like you have evangelical Christians and then you have like new age people and I mean then all the various organized religions so they're they're like different topics or they're different uh, environments to discuss but um anyway my point is i i feel like this could actually this is actually the story of our time and i believe it it's the it's one of the missions of us and by us i mean anybody who is concerned about the direction of the united states but also the world i mean it's not just the us it's it's the world i mean yeah it, um I believe that this this will be the battle of our of our times Um, and if we're going to engage in it and if we're going to fight this battle going forward we need more books like this but not only do we need more books like this the people who believe in freedom and the people who believe in the free markets you got to start putting your money to stuff like this man you got to start putting your money to reservation trash and uh, Ayn Rand and uh, Whoever's out there making things, I don't, I don't I actually really want to plug anybody in particular here, but um, well, other than this book, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, the it has to become this this ideological battle for freedom has to become as important to us as it was to the leftists of the '60s. Although, even though, as I've been studying that, I found out that's, I mean that's even kind of an oversimplification because a lot of those early hippies actually were more libertarian minded people Allen Ginsberg I think openly identified as a libertarian <clears throat> and uh, you know Ginsberg was the beat generation but he was a huge he was kind of like a spiritual godfather to the hippies <clears throat> um, Melanie who uh, uh, the art, the musician Melanie um, she uh, Melanie she um, she also is a libertarian minded person uh, so yeah but but anyway again my point is we need more writers like this we need more books like this and we need to support the writers and books like this and we need to be learning our learning our own positions to the point where if you sit down and have a conversation with people you can engage in an intelligent conversation with them these things matter and it's it's one of the the biggest mistakes of freedom-minded people and you notice i don't like to say conservative because i don't consider myself a conservative and i am fully aware that many aspects of the um, conservative side of the spectrum are not freedom loving like at all um i think that's changing a little bit but um to a large extent like the two parties they just have different things that they believe people should be subjugated to really but um if you're uh, a believer in freedom, then this this battle of this ideological battle of ideas, this culture war, which the term's been used so much, I don't like to use it. It's just in my nature to not like things that are used all the time. But rationally, when I say it, people know what I mean, and um, it actually does matter. Like that, that's the biggest, the most frustrating thing when dealing with freedom-minded people. Um, is I'll so often hear these things like, oh, oh, yeah, like that really matters. Like some stupid book matters. It clearly does because the, most people don't actually make their decisions based on um, carefully thought out rational ideas. Most people are moved by art, books, um, celebrities, um, things such as this. That is where most people get their ideas of what is right and and what is wrong. And um, that's the level they need to be engaged in. Um, Also a level of philosophy and reason. But there's also got to be the component of the culture. There's got to be literature, music, books, all the... uh, 
literature books like this literature music movies etc 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 you guys know what i'm saying and uh yeah i think it's crucially important and that's all i'll say specifically this book which i read two years ago feels more important and more useful and more dignified meaningful and beautiful um, than it did when I initially read it. And I was very impressed. I very much enjoyed just the story itself. But now even more so, I realize how important a book like this is, um, how, uh, how much integrity and courage Harvey had to put it out when Harvey knows damn well that goes, that's totally against the, uh, the predominant um, viewpoint right now. And, uh, yeah, and so it's a book that, number one, I would recommend people reading for your own enjoyment. Also, let's start supporting stuff like this. But also, let's get more into this war of ideas. War of ideas. It doesn't even does it have to be a war of ideas or just a sharing of ideas. I don't know. But, um, yeah, and so it is what it is, man. Check out Ray Harvey. Possibly buy Save the Oxford Comma shirt show people that you're a you're a literate person um but until then let's uh yeah let's get engaged in this thing that's what i say let's do it let's get engaged in this thing all right peace out everybody bye